That is the ordinary astrology, and it's very valuable. You know, any good esoteric astrologer knows their regular astrology too, okay? But we want to refocus our minds at a higher level, as if we really were... Am I doing that? My, I was... <laughs> you see, I'm my own worst enemy. Okay. Mercury is not even retrograde. But you hear me, I know you do. Okay. Check one, two. Here's number two. So who do we think we are? Identified with our normal personality. You know, this is what we, you know, look in the mirror, that's what you get. You know, how do I feel? How do I think? There's more to it. And we want the chart to show the perspective that we will have. right because <clears throat> this could have all been done perhaps 10 minutes before we started but you know all right anyway the seven rays workshop begins on Monday night right in this room and you know astrology is in one hand and the rays are in the other so you need both and we hope you all can come now what was the other thing I was supposed to talk about Oh, yes, okay. Well, now, and who do they see in order to sign up? Yeah, okay. Yes, okay. So if you, how many have not yet signed up for the Seven Rays Workshop? Just a, just a handful. Okay, all right, all right, good. Well, then, just see Olivia or Heidi here, if you're interested in joining. Is that it? Very good. All right. Now, where was I? I think I was on the higher mental plane. Right, okay. That's where we really live. When we die, got your attention, okay. When we die, gradually we work ourselves out of our mortal coils. And there develops an egoic perspective on the higher mental plane in which we see the last several lives, perhaps several lives to come. Was the incarnation a success? What's that perspective? How does it look between lives? We want to be able to look at the chart in such a way that when we arrive at that point, we will see that we have been in alignment with the purpose as seen from the higher mental plane, where the soul lives, where we as a soul live. And when we look at your chart today, it's not about, you know, my house, my dog, my car, my health, and all the rest of it. Those are important things. But it's about your life purpose, and the degree to which this is being actualized at this time through your present incarnation. And we want to look at the indicators that bring this message through, whether it's the planet Venus, which we're going to study today, whether it's the rising sign or any of the other planets in the chart, we want to look at them from the solar angelic perspective. What does it look like from the soul perspective? What does your life look like? what's trying to happen. And that's what this meditation is going to be about. So, we'll have to dim the lights a little bit to get in the meditative state. Is there anybody there that knows how to dim the lights? Right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good. Thank you. We're going to begin by trying to get the feel of the solar angel. We can talk about astrology to we're blue if we don't know what is the presence of the solar angel, what it is within us, what is this great supervising deity 
who was once a human being in a previous solar system, what does that really feel like in our life? Then, when we talk about astrology, we just have to confine ourselves to the personality, and we don't want to do that. So the very first thing is to get an experience of the presence of this inner God that is with you all the time. Of course, it, it attends to its own business too. It has its own work on the higher cosmic ethers, on the buddhic plane and beyond. It has its own work. But this is your inner savior. This is the being without which and without whom most of us would be 10 million years or more in development behind where we are now. So there's been a tremendous sacrifice on the part of this being attending to the kindergarten of humanity. And we owe so much uh, of our present status to the work of the solar angel. But let's at least, you know, most religions don't even consider it. What is it? You know, some people call it your holy guardian angel, whatever. It's within you. It's within your heart. It's within your, the center of your etheric brain. It's, it's within your uh, structure on the higher mental plane. It is, is infusing us all the time. Do we pay any attention? Do we know how to pay attention? That's what this meditation will be about. Okay. So we'll just begin by being relaxed and yet alert. And we'll allow the breath to help us achieve some degree of tranquility in the outer human being. And we withdraw our consciousness inwardly, pulling back from the world which the senses reveal. And pulling back from our feeling states, our desires, our reactions. Pulling back from the contents of the lower mind And realizing that we are none of these vehicles that we commonly use in the personality, we are the point of consciousness in incarnation, in the midst of the vehicles, a tiny and yet extensive point of consciousness, the soul in incarnation. And we are consciousness immersed <clears throat> within the normal field of thought and of feeling and of activity, but we are more. As that outer world begins to fade away, we begin to discover that we are within a higher world, the soul field. And what begins to 
enter our consciousness now. It's a world of inner light, spiritual light. It's a world of connectedness, love and relationship. A world of sensed unity. and divine attraction. And it's a world of power, of spiritual will, of the strength that comes through sacrifice. So it is as if we are now consciously in this different field all of our usual perceptions, they are fading out at the moment. And we are attuning to this soul field of light and love and power. In which we are becoming one field of consciousness together. We are sensing a group soul relationship in which we have an unusual type of connection which is usually not seen or forgotten during our normal personality consciousness. So we are at least imaginatively within our higher egoic nature. Ego with a capital E. The I am sense on the higher mental plane. Identifying as the soul. From this perspective, within the many colored, many tinted lotus that you saw on the screen a little while ago, we are in the field of virtue. Our many accumulated strengths and qualities over hundreds and even thousands of incarnations, we are in the field where all the goodness that we have and are can be accessed and can be expressed. And is blending into and strengthening the virtue of all souls assembled here. The goodness that we have and are is available from each of us to all of us and from all to each. A very rich harvest of so many lives of experience, suffering, joy, the fruit of human experience. And what we want to understand is that there is a being 
who long ago was a human being, we are told in an earlier solar system, an earlier incarnation of our solar god, was a human just as we are. But that this being has gone on for training, further training, perhaps as far as the star Sirius, which is one of the training centers for solar angels, and has returned to our system and to our sphere, the Earth, and somehow, mysteriously, has invested a portion of its consciousness, a portion of its presence, within our energy system. This great solar angel can use the mantra as follows, having pervaded the entire universe with a fragment of myself, I remain. It's the universe of the human being, the fragment of the solar angel. The solar angel is both within us, pervading us, substanding, supervising, guiding, and yet is also external, its own center of energy on the higher planes of our system. So there's always a presence. It's called, in fact, the angel of the presence. Because once we learn to come to terms with it and to penetrate the disk of golden light with which it can be symbolized, we make our way into the pure being which we are, the presence itself. But the angel hides that way, guards that way, until we are ready to stand in the presence of pure being. So within our consciousness, just as a master can enter our consciousness, can slip into our consciousness, fuse with our consciousness. We become an outpost of the Master's consciousness. So it is with the great Holy Guardian Angel, the Solar Angel, slips into our normal consciousness, and is a presence within us. A presence of light and love and power. A presence of great luminosity. And we want to be sensitive enough, meditative enough, be able to call upon that presence, feel that presence within us, and express the will, the intention of that guiding presence who knows what is the purpose of our incarnation, who sees our past several lives and several lives to come. A being with whom we learn to cooperate and thereby make a spiritual success of our incarnation. The Tibetan says, you can visualize this being as a radiant, angelic existence. 
This is seen by the inner eye, he says, with the same accuracy of vision and judgment as when a man stands face to face with another member of the human family. The great solar angel who embodies the real man and is his expression on the plane of higher mind is literally his divine ancestor, the watcher who, through long cycles of incarnation, has poured himself out in sacrifice in order that man might be. Intimate, ever-present, the great solar angel, our true counselor, the first master we meet, an initiate of all degrees, a member of the council chamber within the sun. concentrate particularly within our heart center, in the etheric region in the center of our head where the pineal gland is found, and also at the very center of the egoic lotus, and through all the petals of love, the presence of this being our conscience, our guide, can ever more fully be detected. So feel yourself then as if infused by the presence of this being something we will have to practice every day in our meditation. It is a being who is a consciousness within our consciousness, a being within our being, an intelligence within our intelligence a greater love within the lesser loves we normally call love. In the silence Perhaps this angel of the presence can be sensed. Conveying to us the second aspect of Agni, solar fire, the fire of the heart of the sun, fire of the cosmic higher mental plane, the fire of love, transmutating fire, solar fire. And there is a practical side here, because as we obey the will of this angel, 
This angel who is a heart of fiery love, we are told, a heart of fiery love. We fulfill our part in the plan. And so, we focus within the presence now of this angel of the presence, and we ask ourselves, what is the quality? This angel, through our egoic nature, is attempting to convey to you the disciple, the spiritual aspirant, the aspiring one within the personality. What is attempting to be conveyed? What is trying to come through from this great being? try to realize that it is the luminous state of the angel, generically expressing the second and the fifth rays. It is the luminous state of this angel which makes it possible for each of us to identify as a soul and to learn gradually to look out upon an inner world of light divine. Because our true world is the world of light. All of matter is light, condensed light. We have to learn to penetrate to the light which has become the forms we recognize. Try to realize that the intelligence of this angel is so high that it can successfully use all your ray qualities, all your astrological energies with which you are endowed to achieve the goal which it visualizes for you, a goal in line with your development as a spirit, as a monad. The solar angel knows the purpose and has helped to choose your time of birth so that that purpose can be better enacted, has played upon the permanent atoms of your personality so that certain ray qualities emerge, the better to fulfill the deep purpose of this incarnation. We are in good hands with the solar angel. So great is its intelligence its love and its power.
realize. Try to realize through visualization there is an alignment of this angel with the great star Sirius. with the heart of the sun, the soul nature of our solar god, with the planet Venus, and the aspect of Venus that penetrates the Earth scheme, this angel is aligned with those great sources and is bringing some tiny stream of that higher life right into our energy system. We are connected with the highest heavens through the presence of the angel within us. Try to feel solar fire within your heart. The fire of love and wisdom. The fire which reveals the perfection of the archetypal pattern. And feel yourself related to everyone here in soul through solar fire of the heart, through the solar fire at the top of your head, and the twelve-petaled heart within your head. The solar fire that the angel expresses, the solar fire of Venus and of the heart of the sun, and ultimately of what is for us the cosmic Christ, the Logos of Sirius, the soul of fire within you, knowing that our life cannot be a spiritual success until we learn how to express solar fire in all of our relationships, and obviously through our horoscope and through our rays. We cannot really touch the heart of the sun directly. We cannot really touch Sirius. The masters can barely do that. But some ray from Venus, or from the solar angel representing Venus, can enter our consciousness, enter our energy system, and that's what we want to attune with, this Venusian vibration. Master DK told us to examine the position of Venus in our chart, at least in the chart of disciples. It could be very significant. A gift comes from Venus. It's essentially a solar angelic gift. And it is this gift that will help transform us from the ordinary animal human being, a merely earthly human being, into a conscious being of light and love and power upon the higher planes. The gift of Venus so beautiful now in the night sky, as you may have seen. Here it is, the full moon in Taurus now, the new moon rather, ruled by Venus. Tonight, perhaps you will see it. And come on rapport more closely 
with the gift that is bringing spiritual civilization to humanity and to each one of us. The gift that is conquering Mars, our elemental nature, our personality, the conquest of the animal man through the beautiful presence of Venus through the solar angel. We want to make Venus a potent source in our lives, not just our human attractions, the things we desire and prefer in our taste and so many things in the lower worlds, all important in their own way, but the gift of higher mind, of the luminosity of the solar angel, of the great second and fifth rays, the most light expressive rays, shedding light upon our darkness, upon our ignorance, and extracting us from imprisonment in the world of the senses, in the world of desires, in the world of lower mind, transmuting, alchemizing, extracting, uplifting, until we can really identify as souls who are using the personality and not the other way around. So what is that gift coming to you from Venus? For now, just try to get the feeling of the Venusian beam passing through your solar angel, passing through your egoic nature on the higher mental plane, entering your consciousness your energy system. Feel the beam, the ray, the luminous second ray, fifth ray nature of Venus. Think of the lovely, light-filled, heart-filled, beautiful moments you have had in your life, the gift of Venus. revealing to us an altogether higher life than the one we may be used to living. So for a moment of focused silence, We absorb the presence of the solar angel as much as we can, the love, wisdom, luminous ray of Venus as much as we can. We feel ourselves in communion with these high sources and thus in communion with each other. Be 
becoming, realizing ourselves as one soul. Know my soul, thy soul, one soul, one presence, a field of loving relationships, appreciative of the best in everybody, sharing the best of yourself with everybody and receiving the sharing. The soul consciousness. And this is the consciousness in which we seek to remain, that we seek to access, to touch, to understand as we study together, meditate together during these three days. A consciousness which becomes preeminent, dominant, the dominant in music is the dominance of the soul. This is the consciousness which has to use the energies of your astrological chart according to its purposes. But unless we can identify as a soul, we cannot do that. And so we will go on a search for the ways that the great solar angel can come through, reach us, guide our lives towards their intended fulfillment. And we will study our astrological charts as much as possible to give us indications of how that may be accomplished, how we may cooperate with that greater purpose which is trying to happen in our ordinary human lives. And we will close our reflection by sounding together the great invocation, pausing between the verses and sounding the sacred word Om, the following, the invocation. From the point of light within the mind of God, let light stream forth into the minds of men. Let light descend on earth. From the point of love within the heart of God, let love stream forth into the hearts of men. May Christ return to earth.
from the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide the little wills of men, the purpose which the masters know and serve. From the center which we call the race of men, let the plan of love and light work out, and may it seal the door where evil dwells. Let light and love and power restore the plan on earth. Thank you. Okay, friends. Um, the solar angel is a subtle matter, and uh, our, our lives are oftentimes uh, so noisy and filled with activity, the third aspect of divinity, that we just uh, we're not attuned. But what we will try to do is to tune more deeply to that uh, presence. The interesting thing about Master DK's astrology is it's not just third aspect astrology. It's not just involved with intelligence. It is very intelligent, but not just intelligence. It's involved with wisdom and with love. And to the extent that we bring the love and the wisdom into our astrological interpretations, then we will be doing the true esoteric astrology. Okay. <coughs> now, um, I'd like us to just kind of briefly introduce ourselves where we are from. We have our ever-expanding team of astrologers here, which is now <laughs> international team, now up to about 11, I think. <laughs> Pretty soon we're going to outnumber you. Okay. Uh, I'd, I'd like our, um, our astrologers just to stand up, introduce themselves, uh, and where they are from, basically. It's just very quick, you know, and uh, we'll begin. Heidi. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, Michael Robbins from somewhere. The point. <laughs> Philip Lindsay from everywhere and nowhere. <laughs> That's what I meant to say. Peter Kowalski from the Boston area. Have I forgotten any astrologers? Okay, so now we'll begin with our uh, group. Libby?
here. And just turn around so everybody can get a look. <laughs> okay. Okay, we'll start over here. Yeah, he turned around just the right way. Do you see that? Okay. <laughs> Olivia? Oh, no. Here we are. You start here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Brian. Okay. 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 Mm. Okay, and how about our uh, tech team? <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you, Brett. everybody? Marvelous. So thanks for coming. All right. Now, uh, I'd like a little help here. Maybe Sharon, I have, and Heidi. Here are your charts. Now, I know that we haven't caught everybody because I can see that already. So if your chart, if you do not receive a chart, please uh, write on this piece of paper your name, place of birth, date of birth, and time of birth. And during the intermission, we will try to print this out for you, okay? Because you'll need it. <clears throat> yeah, I was showing Heidi. Now, uh, when it comes to the astrologers, I didn't print out your charts. I assume that's okay. <laughs> okay. A little bit of time, right, okay. Wendy Dashlow? Yeah. She's not here right now. Jan? She's not here? We'll have to get those aside.
Got that, Emma? Okay. All right. Good morning. <laughs> if you've never interpreted a chart before, you have two days to learn. <laughs> Let's see, um, Robin, have you entered all those other ones that we, or, or any of them that are here? You have entered? Right, okay. Okay, there, there are a few more. If you'd be so kind as to enter these so we can print them right out at the break. Yeah, there are a couple of doubles, I'm sorry. Now, if there are any mistakes on your chart, and it does happen, you let us know, and we'll try to fix this when we take our break. So I'll need uh, Robin and I'll need Maria during the break. Now, have you guys got solar fire up? Okay. We could do a, maybe a real quick thing. I've got the, um, I've got this, but uh, there'll be some people who really quickly need to know where their Venus position is. So, all right, while this is, uh, may I have your attention please? While this is happening, let's see. Uh, where are the, where are the, it's on the pad and there's some other pieces of paper. Okay. This is the pad. Now where are the pieces of paper where people wrote, Robin, uh, were the pieces of paper over here? Is Robin still here? They're right there? Carol Warburton? You got it? Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm, maybe you can come over here and show me where they were because we have a couple of people on them and I. Okay. We need, yeah. We need Venus placements for a few people. Um, okay. All right. And where are those other. She's not here? Okay. And was this the, um, Robin, was this the computer you entered them on? This one, okay. So we have to see who the most, John Selke, you know where your Venus placement is? Yes. yes. Okay, and Walter Kuhl, do you know where your Venus placement is, Walter? Okay, it is. <laughs> it looks like it's in Virgo. I'll just uh, check this out quickly. Yeah, Virgo. Virgo? Yeah, very good. Okay, it's Virgo. Good. Okay, and Heidi will come up with your Venus placement <coughs> because you'll need that for this little lecture. Okay. Now, what, how the morning will go is that I'm going to talk about these things for a little while then we will have a break. Then you will get into groups with some of our astrologers and talk about the spiritual meaning of Venus in your chart, the esoteric meaning of it, not just your love life. There is a tendency to look at Venus and say, you know, who do I relate to and how do I relate? And 
is he or she finally coming into my life? Okay, but we're looking from a slightly different angle. So I'll try to explain what that angle may be. <clears throat> All right. As I explained, the great solar angel is our focus. This solar angel, let's see if I can, um, I think I'll try to do it this way. A lot of stuff on this. Fellowship of Cosmic Fire, AAB diagrams. Okay. Okay. Here's our map. And this is a little picture of the egoic lotus. This is the form which over millions of years is being built on the higher mental plane. Every one of these little sort of uh, layers is a vibrational layer, a dimension of consciousness and a dimension of frequency. Upon the higher mental plane, your temple of Solomon is being built. This stays with you life after life. When a master wants to look at you and say, well, how are you doing? You know, what is the real development of this person? This is where they look, on the higher mental plane. The other, um, the other picture of that see, was this. And that's kind of a close-up of it. There's a huge study involved with this egoic lotus and all the colors that are there and all the qualities of the human being which are being unfolded gradually over millions of years. This is the true human being. You know, when you look at yourself in the spiritual mirror, this is what you look like right before the fourth initiation. The majority of us still have a few petals that may not quite be <laughs> unfolded yet nor are we necessarily shining with the full radiance of the glorious sun. But when things are just about to pop, the jewel in the lotus is revealed, the inner synthesis petals are revealed, and all of your qualities are blazing away, and you're a fully developed human being just about to undergo that joyous experience we call the crucifixion. Or, or the great renunciation, or the supernova of your individual identity. So we aspire to be fully unfolded in this manner. We also aspire to do the right thing at the right time which will lead to the next level of unfoldment for us in this egoic flower. All right. So, we're searching for the internal presence of your higher self or your angel in your chart. And we are searching for the way to use the astrological chart to guide ourselves toward our next unfoldment. We are coming into contact with a being from an altogether higher <coughs> hierarchy. That being is within us. This is the picture of it. These are various angelic presences, some of which go to make up the human being. We are found here. This is what our monads are like. We're called the initiates and lords of sacrifice. The solar angels have projected themselves, a fragment of themselves, down into a lower level, and they are providing a vehicle whereby spirit and matter can be connected in our nature. So we are trying to put together their wisdom. Their true home is up here. But they have projected themselves below and are forming this egoic flower that we were just looking at. We are trying to bring all things together. We are trying to achieve integration. Many of us are not yet integrated people. 
We want to integrate within ourselves mind, emotions, and body, and we want to integrate our personality with our soul. That's one of the things we're trying to do. So we're trying to come in alignment with this great hierarchy of solar angels, which helps us do exactly that. We want to use our rays and not be used by them. We want to use our astrological factors and not be used by them. We want to have a willful, purposeful relationship with our energy system and astrological chart. We do not want to be driven up and down the land. We want to be in control and at the center and directing the energies of our lives. This means the power of the will has to increase in all of us, especially the spiritual will. We're going to look specifically at the second ray, fifth ray nature of the solar angel. These are the brightest rays. Very interestingly, these two rays, the second ray of love wisdom and the fifth ray of, well, I would call it luminous intelligence, but it's also called the ray of science and the ray of concrete mind. They are the prominent rays of Sirius, there are others. There are the prominent rays of Venus, there are others. And they are prominently in the life of the solar angel. Although I have thought, and I think it's true, that there are solar angels focused on all seven rays. They have their own ray configuration, and they uh, associate themselves with human beings whose egoic nature is meant to be of a similar ray. But a solar angel has all the rays, and so do we. It's just a question of how to focus. When we study esoteric astrology and rayology, and now you have a chance to do both at this conference because the ray workshop and the astrology workshop are side by side and they are indispensable to each other, you are learning about your energy configuration and how to make the best of it, how to be really intelligent about what you've got and how to use it. That's what we all want to do so we become masters of our lives, so we can become the true directors of our lives and not just people that things happen to. So we're going to take a brief look at how the specific energies of the solar angel and the specific astrological energies can aid in fulfilling what we call a uh, transcendental vision. Let's see, maybe I can do this a little, make it a little bit, I'm going to try something. Yeah, okay. The incarnational vision, a transcendent vision of what your incarnation should be. We're going to focus on Venus now. Here is the hypothesis for the rays of Venus. Every human being has a ray chart. Every planetary logos has a ray chart, including Venus. Every solar logos the same, every constellation logos the same. Every being in our cosmos has the equivalent of a ray chart, meaning they will have a spirit, a soul, a kind of personality, a mind, emotions, and body, just the way we do. So the hypothesis that we're operating with at the moment for Venus is that its monad is primarily on the sixth ray at this time, and its higher spirit ray will be the ray of love wisdom, just like Sirius. It's a two-six monad. And what we're really focusing on during this um, session because the whole conference is given to the fifth ray, the coming of the solar angels uh, living the science of the soul. That's the name of our conference. So we're focusing on the fifth ray, and therefore we are focusing on the fifth ray part of Venus particularly. It has loads of the soft line rays, and even the factor of harmony is very strong with Venus as well. But we're not so much focusing on that. We are focusing more on its light content, the light of the soul how to live an illumined life, and how to eventually take the third initiation in which luminosity, the enlightenment, the satori, the great illumination, these are the factors that come into play. This is the true first initiation, and Venus presides over this initiation. That's what we want. At that time, we can begin to say we are truly human and not before. Before that, we're simply animal man. At that time, we overcome Mars and the moon, and we can say we have begun to live as a human being. And Venus, of course, is spiritually civilizing us along the way, helping us be rid of our worst Martian tendencies so we can just use them for good purposes. Mars, really, a non-sacred planet, does serve Venus. 
and we see that in life anyway. Okay. You know what I mean? Okay. <laughs> ah, yes. Okay. So it is... <laughs> It's the fifth ray we're looking at. Perhaps Venus has kind of a second ray personality. It seems to have this factor of, of harmonization. There's loads of second ray in it. And the beauty factor of Venus perhaps gives it a physical nature of a seventh ray. Those are not what we're focusing on entirely. It's mostly the fifth ray. It's the lighted aspect related to higher mind. And where is the higher mind? We talked about it. The higher mind is on these three subplanes. And let's see, is this the one? Uh, no, it's not the one, but here it is. Okay, I'll go to it. Yeah. We live our personality life on the lower 18 subplanes. This is where life, as we know it, uh, is commonly uh, expressed. We want to get beyond that. The number 18 is the number of the moon in the tarot. We want to get beyond the moon, at least the lower meaning of the moon. We want to move from the 18 into the 19. We want to move to the higher subplanes of the mind where we begin to have what is called spiritual discernment, response to group vibration, and spiritual telepathy. These are soul powers. In other words, if we come here, we want to live as a soul. We have a lot of human problems to solve, no question about it. None of us is a completely altogether personality, perfect, you know, it's not happening yet. It will happen. But already we want to understand what it is to live as a soul. That is the purpose of a meeting like this. It's not your ordinary solve my problems astrology. That will come along too. But the more we live in accordance with what the soul within us seeks to express, the more our outer problems will be solved. And new ones will arise as challenges and opportunities. Okay. <clears throat> now. The Venus experience. It is to a great extent the solar angelic experience. And Master DK said, yes, if you're a disciple, which means you finally made up your mind to do something about your spiritual life, not just when and as you wish, but you really apply your will now, then Venus becomes important in your chart in a spiritual sense, just like some of the fixed stars become important as well. It is the most luminous planet from our earthly perspective. When we're looking out at the night sky, Venus is gorgeously luminous, and that is a symbol of the luminosity we have to achieve when the higher mental plane infuses all of our normally opaque substances. We no longer want to be opaque, do we? We do not want to be opaque to the inner and higher light. We want to be translucent, and then we want to be transparent. Venus is gonna help us do that, okay. So it is the experience, you know, I, I'm just sharing my own views of Venus, and, and I'm going to ask our friends here to join in with their uh, ideas of the spiritual nature of Venus. To me, it is the, under Venus, the experience of luminous unity, light-filled unity. And there's a gorgeous, uh, it's a marvelous little phrase, it's all about let the outer glory pass away and the inner light uh, reveal the beauty of the one, you know. Then let the soul look out upon an inner world of light divine. Venus reveals all of this. Let the beauty of the inner light reveal the one. Have you ever been to a marvelous, uh, let's say, an opera or a great movie or a, a concert, and you feel that behind all the things you've just heard and seen, there is this hidden beauty just existent of its own being revealed and waiting for greater revelation you know some of those nights when i've seen wonderful shakespeare comedy you know maybe out in the uh, a natural setting you just get the feeling of what shakespeare understood about life and there was this inner light behind all that he wrote about the drama of life this is the venus experience to me you know, it, it, it is a, a rare thing. And it makes time kind of come together. You know, the, the universal aspects of beauty begin to reveal themselves. So those of you who are artists and in music, you know, maybe you, you know what I'm talking about, and maybe we all do. Okay. So it's the light of beauty. The beauty of the inner light, let the beauty of the inner light reveal the one. It is so interesting, too, because, you know, Venus is a fifth-ray planet, in a way. 
And you've all seen the tetractes, you know, one, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, you know, like bowling ball, you know, bowling pins. Here's the tetractes, and right under the one is the five. See, the sun, you see, if you, if you make a straight line from the one, you go right down to the, to the five. One, two, three, four, five. It's right under the one. So the sun aspect, the five aspect, reveals the one. The beauty of the inner light, the light of the sun, reveals the beingness, the will of the father aspect of divinity. Let the beauty of the inner light reveal the one. Let the sun reveal the father. Let the five reveal the one. Now that's a lot of what we're doing too. We're trying to get soul consciousness, right? We're, we're talking about that. But beyond that soul consciousness and within it is something else. It's the presence itself. It's pure being. It's the thing we all share. I don't care what our quality may be, what we look like, what we think like, what our diversity may be. We share one thing and that is pure being and that is the father aspect and we all have that. The very fact that you are is the statement. We all share one thing in common. We are being. Okay. So with Venus comes an especial clarity of relationship, and not just superficial relationships, relationship of essence to essence. Sometimes Venus is called the quint essence, the fifth essence, the quint essence. It's an abstraction. It's like a pyramid in a way. You have the four points of the base, but above the pyramid rises the one point, which is the quint essence. So it has extracted all of beauty and value from everything that's going on in the lower part of the pyramid. It's a feeling, it's, it, it's an experience of loving harmony. It has the second and the fourth ray connections with it. And um, harmony is very pleasant, but uh, you know, there's superficial harmonies. This is a harmony of essences. This is a real love relationship. Um, a marriage of true minds on the higher mental plane. Venus is all this. I call it also kinship in soul with one and all. Kinship, you know, kin is you're like someone else. Kindred, your kind, kin. We are related on the level of beauty and harmony. So who are our kin? Are they just our blood relations? <laughs> Hardly that, right? Matter of fact, that's where you can find the war, right? Right in your own home with all those Martian lunar blood relations, right? But, the, but in terms of the the true soul relationship, that's where the harmony can be felt, especially starting with our soul ray groups and eventually with all souls. It's just one soul anyway, isn't it? Okay. We learn with Venus that all things are externalizations of the light. The light is substance. We are light. The discoveries along the fifth ray line and first ray line have revealed that all matter is light. And that's what DK was telling us with the uh, revelation of atomic energy and the huge power released, matter is light. So can we see and sense the light content in each one of us and can we liberate the hidden dark light? That's what we have to learn how to do and that's what any master can do and that's why they can appear and disappear at will. You know the old stories of Apollonius of Tyana. They used to say, well, who needs Jesus? We have Apollonius. Well, it turned out to be the same person. Okay. But anyway, he, you know, he'd be in the middle of a court. He'd say unpleasant things. People would run toward him to grab him, and he'd just disappear. This is a mastery of light. This is an ability to uh, create and precipitate out of the lighted world your vehicle and to dematerialize it at will. All of these cities are coming you know, but we have to be morally okay before we can really use them. You know how the Buddha said <laughs> his arhats wanted to have a holiday and make a miracle. <laughs> so, you know, he said, all right, he let him make a miracle. And then they, they all made their miracle, and uh, he said, uh, okay, now go fix it. There's a ship sinking out there. You caused it. Bring relief. A person is lost in a mountain. You caused it. Bring relief. They upset the balance. This is in the Agni Yoga books, you see. They wanted phenomenal expression. You know, let's do something phenomenal. You know how people say, oh, that's phenomenal. That's we want something noumenal, don't we? Not just phenomenal. 
So manipulation of phenomenal apparent reality is not what we're after. We have to have the inner core of wisdom and morality before we can tinker around with the cities, you know, the powers. Anyway, that was the digression. All right. So we are externalizations of the light. Imagine feeling the magnetism of divine beauty. You know, beauty is everywhere, everywhere, even in what is apparently ugly. And I think the further we go along the path, the more we realize that. These are the things that Venus means to me, you know. And I'm, I'm just, you know, kind of sharing them. Um, the experience that all conflict and antagonism has been resolved in the light and that a true peace is prevailing. Venus is very common in the peace movement, especially as the upward pointed star. All right, so just for a moment, just, just try to, well, well, I'll tell you what, what else about Venus? First, astrologer friends, what else would you add to the spiritual nature of Venus? Okay, very, very good. Kind of, of, uh, Hello? Hello. All right. Good, good, good. Let me know when you find me. Okay. So, um, other thoughts about the spiritual nature of Venus? Uh, Venus um, reconciles the pairs of opposites upon the mental plane and creates beauty which actually filters down to the astral plane to the more well-known interpretation of Venus. Reconciling the pairs of opposites on the mental plane. Okay, creating mental beauty. Okay, good, good. All right, well, that's probably, you know, that's probably enough. Um, what I want to do rel relatively quickly, because I want to, to break this by 11 o'clock and maybe sooner, Am I good here yet? Hello? Okay, I'm out. Right. I want to, does everybody know where your Venus is? Now, you do. No? No. So, so it, raise your hand if you don't and, and some ambient astrologer will help you. Anybody need a little help with their Venus? Taurus, Venus and Taurus. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any help? Right? Good? Good, good, good. Now look, long ago, uh, Nicholas and I and an astrologer from Denmark uh, got together and thought a lot about Venus. We got loads of stuff on Venus. <laughs> but I just want to look at a couple of essentializations here about your Venus position from a spiritual point of view. Not the normal things at all. And this, this is just the smidgen of, of what it could be. Um, 
Who has Venus in Aries? Okay, all right. Now I'm just, I'm not going to deal here with the normal interpretations about falling in love instantly, okay? Not that. <laughs> I won't talk about that. <laughs> I'm just going to say a few things about the light, the fifth ray content of Venus in relation to these signs. And then when you get together with your astrologers, uh, right after the break, we will see what it seems to mean to you. These are just my thoughts, but you have your own, and that's important. So with Venus and Aries, it's the light of the higher mind that can reveal the light of pure being. Venus is about the soul, and Aries is about God the Father aspect. Uh, we're told that Venus is in detriment in Aries because in a way the soul nature or the conscious nat nature falls away and pure being is revealed. So you're piercing through the disk of golden light into the presence of being, the first aspect of divinity, Aries, uh, in, uh, is expressed powerfully through the love wisdom of Venus, and the soul is acquiescing to the spiritual will. The son or the father uh, acquiesces to the father. It's a bit of not my will but thine be done. The father aspect is represented by Aries. Okay, who has Venus in Taurus? Okay? All right, it's not just love of sweets. Okay. <laughs> That's good too, yes? <laughs> okay. Uh, the registration of all material phenomena as essentially light. A beam of glamour destroying light from the Ajna center. Because Taurus is the sign of luminosity, the fifth ray is involved. You train that beam of light on the astral plane and destroy those forms which magnetize you to. Uh, the, uh, to that particular world of form instead of releasing you into the world of higher beauty. There's a lot of beauty in this particular um, uh, combination. The transmutation of desire, ordinary desire, into aspiration for the light. These are just a few things, there's 30 of them that we can discuss, but you can think about that. There's, there's great beauty in this combination and it has much to do with music and art and so forth. Who has Venus in Gemini? Okay. Right, it's not just love letters. Okay, <laughs> it is that too. <laughs> okay, um, harmonious relationships between the brothers in the light. In other words, like I think Philip was, was talking about what you say, reconciling the opposites upon the mental plane. Well, the opposites are also, in a way, the, the part of the mind that has to do with personality and the part of the mind that has to do with soul. And there's a magnetic rapport uh, that pulls these two things together. It really pulls soul and personality together so they can, um, they need to be a little higher perhaps, so that they can manifest uh, in a loving relationship, soul and personality in a loving relationship. It's the science, fifth ray, of soul personality relationships and all of the magnetism that can exist between these two. I'm, I'll give you all these notes. If you want them, I'll just send them to you, okay? So, all right. Who has Venus in Cancer? Home sweet home. Eating sweets at home. No, it's more than that. <laughs> okay, DK says it actually makes the mind the servant of the personality. He doesn't give it such a good rap, but basically, let's just say the personality is filled with elementals. It's got a physical, emotional, and mental elemental nature. They are lower involutionary lives, and Venus redeems all that. The darkened chamber of the personality and its elementals becomes illumined. So it's light, like having a light in a dark house. The greater light of the fifth ray reveals the nature of the dark light of matter. So you know how cancer hides the light in a way, and Venus comes there and makes this vessel luminous. So, you know, whatever you consider your home, you can illuminate it and make it beautiful and radiant through the power of Venus, okay? And, I, and I've seen, you know, you know there's, there's a lot of love in the home with these people. Venus and Leo, it's not just jewelry. Who has it? Okay. <laughs> I've seen it, you know, they like to wear things. Uh, it's, it's a, it's <laughs> and they also like to look in the mirror. A little. <laughs> well, then who doesn't? All right. Appreciation of the luminosity of the higher self. The union of the light of the soul and the light of the concrete mind. This is very fifth ray. This is very, very bright. Because Leo 
is a fifth ray sign as well as a first ray, as you know. And Venus is the fifth ray planet. And, and also, it's got a lot of second ray in it. It's very magnetic. But we're not talking about the magnetism. We're talking about the mental part of this. It's discriminating using the fifth ray. What is the true ego and what is the apparent ego? Do you love yourself as you seem to be or do you love the self as it is? What is the real identity here? You know, what do you think you are? Who do you think you are? You know the old saying, who do you think you are? But that's a really good question. Who do you think you are? That's the basis of so many things. So it's the radiance and glory of the soul. It, you know, it, it, it does make radiant people, of course. But what we're interested in is this radiance on the higher mental plane. And when you get that brightest of all planets, along with Leo, the most glorious of all signs. Who's a Leo here? The most glorious of all signs, yes. Okay, then you really get a display of light. Okay, Venus and Leo, a lot of fifth ray. Venus in Virgo. Oh my goodness. Well, <clears throat> excuse me, I better straighten up here. <laughs> you have Venus, I know, I know. You no, no, I'm in Taurus, you know. No. <laughs> Venus in Taurus. The, the, okay, the beauty of nature's particular designs. Here we have all of the forms of, of, of nature, all of the, the precision of form and the beauty of the precision of form. It's knowing how to transmute material energy into soul energy. Virgo let matter reign. It captures the material energy and when Venus comes along, it lifts these energies into the soul state. It's also a tremendous service of the soul to the lower life forms because it falls in, in, in um, Venus falls in the sign Virgo. The solar angel has fallen down for service purposes into the realm of matter to lift up all of these material lives. There's a very strong service purpose here as well, as well as, you know, I imagine, I don't know, I think that Venus and Pisces people would make great watercolorists. But I imagine that Venus and Virgo, when they were little, they didn't want their colors to run into each other. You know, they just keep, keep the line, keep the discrimination. Maybe they even sorted their food out on their plate according to colors. I don't know. Anyway, the, the, the science of releasing the Christ consciousness from the grip of material forces. I'm, I'm talking about high things now, you know, but I'm assuming that we all aspire to high things. I'm assuming that. You know, I'm assuming that the people who are in this room are tired of living strictly as personalities. Am I mistaken? See me later. Uh, all right. Venus in Libra. Who has? Okay, it's a, said to be a nice position. Uh, it's, it's a ruling. Uh, the revelation of true relationship based on soul patterns. Not just I like you, you like me, we're attracted to each other. It's our souls are coming into union through harmony. So there's a great beauty possible here. Keen discrimination between the pairs of opposites, the soul and personality, and between men and women, of course, and the light which reveals with exactitude the difference between things and the way they can fuse accordingly between the pairs of opposites. It's the union of love and wisdom. It's the light of the soul upon the spiritual path. It keeps you going on the spiritual path because that beam of light, light on the path, Libra is the path, you don't want to get off that, and Venus is the illumining beam. So it is it, right at that point when you're discriminating between soul values and personality values. Venus is the, the planet of values, of course, and it needs much discrimination to learn what are true soul values. Who has Venus in Scorpio? Okay, right. Okay, you know, they say fatal attraction. Anyway, uh, it is, but, but it's very good. It's like Christ going down into hell, you know. I mean, every, you know, Venus in Scorpio, you, at some time in your life you find out what hell is, okay? The destruction of Maya and glamour through a beam of light. It is really de-glamorization. You know, there's all of these forms of illusion and all of these attractions into the lower world and then temptations. And finally, you apply that fifth ray beam and you decide it's not worth it. You know, that, that comes later. Okay. The Christ nature which brings love into the lower worlds of vice and entrapment. The harrowing of hell, you might say. 
Venus the soul comes down into this world where all the vices are rampant and extricates you through the power of love. So, you know, what, you, know <laughs> you can love t totally horrible things at first, and then you see beauty in even those horrible things. It's a great position. It's, in it, it's said to be weakened, but uh, not weakened in a higher sense. Okay. Who has Venus and Sagittarius? Okay. My, my love is always in another country. So, <laughs> and I've got to go there and find, find out. Okay. It's, it's the um, great quest for discovery of that which lies beyond the lower 18 subplanes. It's the quest for the soul, quest for the higher mind. One sets one's sights upon the soul and discovering its nature. And, you know, in a way, you see the beauty of other cultures and other places. You want to go there. You want to study it. It's, I, I sometimes call it the National Geographic Consciousness. You know, you, there's so many beautiful places, and you want to see the beauty, and actually you want to study what it's all about. So it's the union of the higher mind and the abstract mind becomes possible under this Venus position. Uh, anybody else have anything to say about Venus and Sagittarius? It's, it's a great position. Um, uh, you, you, will, you will find your love in South America. <laughs> it's so Sagittarian, you know. With a guitar, all right. Anybody like flamenco? We ought to have a flamenco dance thing here. All right. Anyway, <laughs> Venus in Capricorn. Who has that? All right. Well, that's that's a, that's a nice high position, you know. Um, a taste of the light sublime and of the light supernal. The higher mind and the higher fifth ray are now in control. So really, this is. The, this is beauty upon the mountaintop. You know, it means many other things. I mean, I won't even get into all those other things that it means. Uh, what else do we want to say about Venus and Capricorn and, and its spiritual nature? Guys, anything? Venus and Capricorn? One of those things, you know. Anyway, glory on the mountaintop, okay? This is the ruler of the third initiation. This is how it, you know, when you climb the mountain of karma, the 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 light of the Ajna center is blended with the light of the top of the head, and Venus is the Ajna center, and Vulcan comes down, and the blaze of light in your head. This is the beginning of the light sublime. So it's a very lighted experience. And it also shows you that the soul has to be found upon the summit. So it is a climb. You know, you, you really have to, through labor and effort, you have to rise to that beauty. Okay. All right. Venus in Aquarius. Hey, friends. Okay. Yes? Peter, yes. Go ahead, Peter, please. Something to say about uh, Venus and Capricorn. I please. Thought. It's probably the light that illuminates the pure nature of spiritual love at the mountaintop. The true nature of spiritual love at the mountaintop. Because it's the hierarchical ruler. Hierarchical ruler. Exactly. Very high position. You know how it goes with ordinary rulers, esoteric rulers, and hierarchical rulers. Venus is the highest ruler of Capricorn. Okay. Yes, I, you, all these things you can discuss together when you're in your groups, all right? All right. Um, so Venus and Aquarius, the true friend, okay? Uh, it's the, the revelation not only of the love that is inherent in monadic brotherhood, but it's the scientific nature of brotherhood. Brotherhood as a fact. The fifth ray and the fifth ray. Aquarius, the fifth ray, and Venus, the fifth ray. Okay. Uh, you know, it's also, you know, this whole question about friends and lovers. You know, I think there's a book by that name, isn't there? D.H. Lawrence or something? I don't know. Anyway, he was on the prescribed list. I never read him. <laughs> you have to be older to know what this joke is. All right. <laughs> it's seeing through the illusory nature of all but soul-spirit relationships. You know how impersonal Aquarius people can be. So they tend not to become so emotionally involved. The relationships that we're talking about here are spirit and soul relationships. They also are great bringers of group harmony. I found that to be the case, but that's not so much on the fifth ray. It, it is the science of the soul. This is what I think is, will happen here. The fifth ray of Aquarius and the fifth ray of Venus will reveal the science of the soul. All right, and finally, Venus in Pisces. Anybody? Only a couple, okay. Well, uh, it is a beautiful exalted position here. It's the union of light and love. It's the relationship between hierarchy and Shambhala. 
It's the revelation of the light of synthesis, and it's the union of Manus and Budi. There are also many wonderful greeting cards which are kind of blurring the images, and they look ever so attractive. But that's not the fifth ray part of Venus and Pisces. It's a very strong, uh, high love connection. It's a, what were you saying about the union of intelligence and love? Very much so with Venus and Pisces. Are there any questions? You all have a Venus, correct? And you have a sense maybe now of its spiritual, <laughs> its spiritual meaning. All right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to, are there any questions? Why? Okay. That is the big question. <laughs> we're going to take a little break. Uh, or, by the way, would you like to add anything before we take our break? The, um, uh, has a lot to do with the unconditional love and compassion through understanding. So through understanding, the ray. exactly. So it blends that idea of really being able to see with clarity and know what is the condition of others. You know, you're not missing anything, but still the love and compassion are there. You know, usually when you think about Venus and Pisces, it has a very strong second ray, sixth ray connotation. It's really on the love aspect, but the intelligence of Venus is so luminous and so clear. And you know, for a compassionate person, it doesn't mean you're blind or unthinking, not at all. So you can see the limitations and still love and have compassion. As a matter of fact, that's the name of the game, isn't it? The more you really see and understand what the limitations are, the more you really, uh, the compassion is fed.